we're just going to take a look in the word and and see what the Lord has for us. Turn with me in your Bible to the third chapter of Genesis. You know, Reverend Foreman preached a message, uh, Who Do Men Say That I Am? And it was a very powerful message. You know, Jesus is at the center of everything, and whether you believe who he is, whether you understand who he is, he's in the, 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 the consciousness of, of everyone, even if you don't understand. You don't understand, well, well why? Why Jesus? Why did he die? What was the reason for, for him to come down and take on human flesh and, and to die on the cross? You know, we want to take a few minutes of your time and just kind of revisit the why Jesus. At least that's what I hope we do. I don't. I guess it's fortunate or unfortunate for me. I don't take a whole lot of notes and so forth. And so, you know, I just kind of just go where the Lord leads me. So I'm saying this, and we may go in a totally different direction. But it'll be the word of God, and it'll be the good news of Jesus Christ that we can be sure of. The third chapter of Genesis the first verse. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be, des excuse me, to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband, with her and he did eat and their eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the lord god amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, or gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, 
Upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that in your word, Lord, we see where mankind went wrong, Lord. Because of your word, Lord, we see the inception of sin and death. Lord God, but also, Lord, in your word, we see your mercy and grace in your redeeming power. Lord God, open your word to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Eventually, I'll stop sweating. So we find ourselves in the book of Genesis. Genesis. And here, in this book of beginnings, this was written by Moses. And Moses spent time with God, and God showed Moses the beginning of everything. He showed Moses the beginning of mankind. And showed Moses where the relationship between man and God was broken. Adam and Eve were innocent. And God had made everything for man. Before man was even placed in the garden, it was prepared for him. The Bible says that in the beginning, in the very first verse, it says that God made the heavens and the earth. And it was, it was void and darkness was upon it. And, and by the word of God, light came forth. And the animals were created. And the, the, the seas were created. And vegetation and everything that exists, all the things that you think of were created out of nothing. And after he created this, he said, let us make man in our own image. Man was special. All this was because God loved man so much. And it was fellowship with God and man. As we, we read, it, it gives us an indication that, that God, it was his practice to be in company with man. It says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. As if it was a normal practice to be in fellowship with man. But now because of disobedience, because if we go back, let's just take a, a quick Look at verse uh, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, and the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In other words, in the day that you disobey me, 
you will die. The introduction of death. The introduction of sin. And as we read in our text, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Now they have gone from innocence to sinners. Now they have gone from innocent to hiding from the presence of God. And because Adam is the seminal head of the human race, meaning that all of us come from Adam, and not only is he the seminal head, but he is the federal head in the sense that when he made decisions, it impacted all of us. When he sinned against God and was disobedient to God, and when he became a sinner, everyone that was born after him was born a sinner. You were, as David put it, born in sin. So we find ourselves here in the garden with disobedience. And God handled the disobedience with two distinct things. One, man had to be removed because God is holy righteous and just and you can't be in God's house in disobedience you can't be in paradise and be in disobedience the punishment for this sin was death so man was was separated from God. The fellowship is now broken. Now man is a sinner. The other thing is that God made a way. And here in this 15th verse is the, the first messianic prophecy. It says that I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what it's saying, when it makes reference to the seed of a woman, it's talking about Jesus. It's talking about the one who was born of a virgin, who had a miraculous birth. We know that the seed is normally in the man. But when Jesus was born, there was no man involved. It was the Holy Ghost. So here is, at the very beginning, our hope. The bad news was that there was a death sentence placed on man. The good news was the Messiah will come. So he says that you're going to bruise his heel. That's Jesus' death on the cross. And it also says that he shall bruise thy head, making reference to the victory Amen. that Jesus is going to have. Amen. That the devil is going to be brought to an end. Not only is he going to have victory over the devil, but over sin and death. Here in Genesis it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. But then John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. 
Jesus was there from the very beginning. He was there all along. See, the thing about sin, the thing about this imputed sin, see, it's not a matter of just the things that you do. It's not a matter of the fact that you have performed sinful acts and done sinful things. You're a sinner because you were just born. You were born in sin. And because you were born in sin, you needed help. Because there had to be a punishment for sin. See, God is sovereign, and everything that he does is right. His displeasure is right. His anger is right. Everything he does is right. That's man's biggest problem is the sovereignty of God. Conforming to the sovereignty of God and, and accepting that he is sovereign, meaning that he can do what he want to do. He can say what he want to say. He can save who he wants to save. See, when you talk about the sovereignty of God, you can go down a rabbit hole and get yourself in trouble. And what I mean by that is God saved us, and it's inexplicable. Because why didn't he save this man? When God reached in the dumpster, because that's where he found most of us, in the garbage can, in the toilet. That's his business. That's where he works, and that's where he operates. And when he reached down, he grabbed you. But there was other people in there. And you don't know their story. And sometimes when people try to ration and reason God's sovereignty, they start looking at themselves and saying, then it must be something special about me. I must be somebody special. See, when you think about God's sovereignty, the best thing you can do Be quiet and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. I don't deserve it. It's undeserved grace. I don't understand why you came and saw about me. I was the worst of the bunch. I was the one that started them doing what they're doing. But I was the one that you saved. You could have came, because the Bible says that no man comes to God except he is drawn by the Spirit of God. Yeah, salvation is for everyone, whosoever will. Everybody can be saved, but everybody's not saved. Some people are still bound in sin. Some people are still lost in sin. But I'm free. I'm free. Don't know how I got free. Wasn't thinking about Jesus. Wasn't looking for Jesus. How many of us can say, I wasn't looking for Jesus. Jesus found me. Didn't know anything about it. Didn't know that he died on the cross for my sins. Didn't even know I was a sinner. I thought I was fine. Like the apostle Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus, all his thoughts was to eradicate the, the, this community of people that have given their lives over to a man that died on the cross. And they keep talking about in him 
is salvation. Talking about eternal life comes from him. And Paul was angry. He made it his life mission to break this thing up. Breaking up households. Dragging people to death and to jail. He was there when Stephen was stoned. And while he was on the way to do more damage to the people of God, he left his own area to go to another area, got permission to go somewhere else. And on the way, he said, I saw a light shining bright as the sun. And Jesus called out to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard to kick against the pricks. And Paul, experiencing this, just said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Jesus made the first move. Jesus called out to him. Of all people, Paul probably thought, of all people, why me? I'm his, his arch enemy. So when you think about God's sovereignty, when you think about your own salvation, just say thank you, Jesus. Don't try to be deep with this thing. Don't try to make yourself look better than you are. Sometimes you save so long, you start to, to, to believe your own press. People don't know how you used to be, and they see you now, and they, brother, you's a good man, and I wish, you know, I could be like you, and man, you're a great guy, and all the things that people say to we as Christians. And then we start to, yeah, I'm a good guy. I'm better than him, I'm better than him, I'm better than them. And you look at the unsaved and you forget that I was once lost. Turn with me into one of my favorite scriptures. I'm off script. I'm way off script. Ephesians, the second chapter. See, we were dead in trespasses and sin. And you, Ephesians, the second chapter, hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations or conduct in times past in the lust of our own flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, by nature, But God, Lord have mercy. It should be underlined in everybody's Bible. But God, but God. That's it. I was all these things, did all these things. I was just like everybody else, lost in sin, bound in sin, bound in sin. Can't find my way out. Couldn't do it on my own. People have been trying to deliver themselves outside of Jesus Christ for centuries. And you can't do it. You can't bring about your own salvation. You can't bring about your own deliverance. It's but God. 
but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Lord, have mercy. The love of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God. Turn with me to another scripture. In Titus. The third chapter. The third verse. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse or different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. There was nothing we could do. We had to go to him. In of ourselves there was nothing we could do. You had to get deliverance from Jesus. Life is in Jesus. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Christ Jesus our Savior, being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity. We have disobeyed God from the very start. It wasn't too long after Adam and Eve sinned that their, their children, one murdered the other. Not too long after that, during the time of Moab, uh, Noah, the, the sin had just ran rampant. Because of this sin nature, we couldn't help ourselves. But because of Jesus, because of his saving power, because he loved us, he loved us so much that he, he reconciled us to himself. He took on the punishment. When you say, well, well why did he go on the cross? Because there had to be a, a, a punishment for sin. He took on all the sins that, that we committed, all the sins that made us who we are, and he took it to the cross. And he was separated from the Father, and he experienced death. But by his own power, he rose again. And we live because he lived. That's why Jesus, that's why he's the center of everything that we do. We that know him as Lord and Savior, we that have given our lives to him, it's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Because of him, we're here. Because of him, we're saved. You may not know him. You may not know him in the pardon of your sins. The Bible says, when you hear his voice, 
harden not your heart. When you hear God calling you, he's calling every man. He's petitioning every heart. Don't harden your heart. And Brother Rods preached a, a message about the, the sin of unbelief. But you don't believe that Jesus died for you. But you don't believe that there's anything wrong with you. That's one of the, the biggest problems that we have is that People don't see that they need Jesus. They don't see that they're sinners. They don't see that there's anything wrong. I'm fine, just the way I am. And Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You're not fine. You may not be having or performing sinful acts. You may not be a fornicator. You may not be a liar. You may not be a homosexual. But you don't believe. And you were born in sin. You can go to hell and miss heaven by just not believing just not receiving Jesus. Unfortunately, there will be those that will miss out on the gift of God because they said, I didn't need God. I'm fine. And that's what, what comes into the hearts of those that, that have received him. You realize, I'm not fine. Something is wrong. I need help. I need Jesus. I'm not right. I remember when I got saved, And I presented myself to the Lord. The Lord came and saw about me. And many of you know, when I was saved, I was in bed. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I would be able to stay saved. After I had given my heart to the Lord, I remember saying to myself, I knew I wasn't going to be the same. And I remember saying, I'm never going to be the same again. Even though I didn't think that I, I, I couldn't make it through the week. But God is, he's something else. He is something else. He is something else. Salvation is such a miracle. Because not only did I make it through the week, but it's been over 40 years. He kept me. He put something in me that, a, 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 I, I call it a, a, a governor. Something that, that when I would go to do wrong, that it would just give me enough pause to ask for help. Give me enough pause to change my mind. Something that he does. The Bible says that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. We're not the same. Something is different. Something happened to me. And it's inexplicable. It is a miracle. When a person comes to Christ and gives his life, and he becomes a a new creation. You know your own testimony. You know how you used to be. How you used to think. The things you used to do. And now, in 
inexplicably, I don't do these things anymore. I don't want these things anymore. I want to serve God. You know, when, when um, and I'm jumping all over the place, so you have to forgive me. Because like I said, I, I went off script. There's no sense even me trying to look at the notes because now there, it's like one big blank page. But when Jesus appeared to the disciples after he rose again, and they all had gathered at Sept Thomas, and Thomas wasn't there, and the disciples were telling Thomas, we saw the Lord, he appeared, and Thomas said, I won't believe until I see the prince in his hands and to see his side. He said, I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus appeared again. And when Jesus appeared, he just appeared. He didn't open the door or, or come through the doorway. He just appeared in the room. And Thomas began to, to worship him and, and my Lord and my God. And, and, but the thing that Jesus said to him, he said, you believe because you've seen. He said, but blessed are those that believe and don't see. You're here with me, but it's more blessed to have a hold on Jesus by faith. Amen. Thomas saw him there in person. But we that are saved here and those that have never seen Jesus, we're holding on by our faith. That's a miracle. That you can, what did uh, 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 Brother Will would say? It don't take this long to, to figure out whether this thing is real or not. It don't take 40 years, 50 years to figure out, hey, wait a minute. This is all wrong. It don't take that long. We're holding on to Jesus by faith. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. That's how we're living. And see, the thing about faith, it, 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 it doesn't work like logic. It's just faith. And the thing about faith is you don't have to be of a certain intelligence. It's just faith. Jesus said it, I believe. It's in the Bible, I believe. I don't have to try to figure it out. You know, we have those that, you know, and in, in, in not knocking them, it's, it's good work, and it's good to study your Bible, and it's good to know, and you have these uh, uh, um, apologists that, you know, break down, and, and in, in certain circles, you need intelligent people. But I just love the fact that you don't need to be intelligent, you know, and scholarly to be saved. You don't have to have a deep understanding all you have to do is latch on with your faith. Just grab hold of Jesus with your faith. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I got this much faith. And I'm using this much faith that I have, and I'm going to hold on to Jesus. I'm going all the way with Jesus. There's a lot of things that I don't understand. Sometimes we get in the pulpit and, and we say things and we don't have an opportunity in preaching to explain everything. So you got to just kind of just hold on to say, Jesus loves me. I, I understand that. I'll work with that. Jesus saves. I'll work with that. Call on Jesus. I'll take that. You must be born again. I'll go with that. You know, I remember when the pastor 
was talking about uh, his father-in-law, Sister Christine's father, when he got saved. And he led him to Christ, and he was well into his 90s. And with, with the measure of faith he had at that age was, Rob got me good with the church. He said, I, I'm, I'm in good. He didn't, be, he didn't have the, 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 all the church knowledge to articulate and, you know, I'm saved by grace, and uh, let me turn, turn with me in your Bible, and I'll tell you what the Lord did. Me. He said, Rob got me good with the church. He said, that's all I know. I'm right. I'm in good. He said the sinner's prayer, and the Lord looked on his heart and saw that this man, sometimes he say, it's just, I ain't going to do it no more, Jesus. I'm stopped doing it, and I'm going to do what you said. No more bad. I'm be good. And your faith will just take you that far. You're saved. Because you, because put it, repent means to turn around, to turn from what you're doing, to acknowledge that you're a sinner, to acknowledge that you're wrong and he's right. No more my way. His way. That's what salvation is. No more me, him. I'll do what you say. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But I know I ain't supposed to do this. I ain't supposed to do that. I ain't supposed to do the other thing. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to try to read the Bible. How many of you have started reading your Bible when you first got saved and you had no clue what you was reading? But you just said, I'm going to just keep reading because I know it's a good thing. It's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to just read. How many of you, when you were praying, you was like, I don't even know what I'm saying. But I've never prayed before. Help me, Jesus. Help me to stop smoking. Help me, Lord. I know I did wrong today. Hey, I never prayed before. Is that praying? Yes, that's praying. Calling on Jesus. It's the best kind of prayer. There's a, a, a story in the Bible where there was a, a man that was extolling all his virtues. I did this. I pay this amount of money, and, and I'm a good person, and I'm this, that, and the other. And there was a man that just sat there beating on his chest. Lord, be merciful to me. Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, that man was the one that went home justified. Because he saw that I need help. My way is wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. You don't have to be an intellectual to get saved. All you have to do is repent and acknowledge who Jesus is. Your word says you were born of a virgin. I wasn't there, but I believe it. Your word says that you died on a cross for my sins. I don't fully understand it, but I believe it. Your word says that you rose again three days later. I'll tell everybody that asks. How many of us, when we first got saved, and you trying to witness to somebody and trying to tell them, getting all confused, you don't know what you're saying. All you know is, I'm, I'm not the same. I'm, I'm different. I, I don't do that anymore. Sometimes all you could say was, yeah, I'm not coming. I, I'm going to church. And that's your testimony. You know, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm going to church. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going with them, the, the church people. Because of, of Jesus. There was a story in the Bible, in John, the sixth chapter, when Jesus 
fed the 5,000. And he allowed the disciples to go over to Capernaum to, and he followed behind later. And then the people, after he fed the people, you know, they, whoa, you know, they knew that uh, 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 this man got food. He was able to pull food up out of just, just nowhere. He, he got food. He got stuff. And you think about it, how important food was, how hard it was to get food. And if a man is able to feed 5,000 people plus in one setting, we need to follow that man. So that's what they did. They went over to Capernaum too. And when Jesus saw them come, he said, you didn't follow me because of the, the miracles, but because of, of the food. Matter of fact, let's just read it. Go to John, the sixth chapter. I'm almost done. I'm so off script that uh, we don't know where we're going to end. I'll start at the, uh, the 26th verse. So, Jesus says, and Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, you seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Then he tells them, labor not for the meat which perish, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for in him hath God the Father sealed. And they said, or then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now that question, um, if you look in other translations, basically what they were saying is, uh, what, what, what must we do uh, to do the works that is required? Like, what does God require? That was the question that they were asking, basically. Because he's telling them that, you know, don't labor for the meat which perish but for the meat which endure unto everlasting life. And they're, and they're like, well, okay, well, what does God require for me to get this everlasting life? What is the requirement? And then Jesus says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the requirement or the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. That's the requirement for eternal life. Even Jesus said that, you know, no man gets to the Father but by me. You got to go through Jesus. So the requirements for eternal life is in Jesus. So when you say, well, why Jesus? What makes him so important? If you want to have eternal life, if you want to have joy and peace, you got to go through Jesus. He is the, 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 the love of God in, 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 the, in, in a human body. He's God in, in human flesh. God came down and took on human flesh. Nothing but love. It's all love. And he died for our sins. He took on the punishment 
so that we can be free. We can be no longer bound to sin. He, he has given us the victory over sin and death. Now that we're saved, death has no sting. We don't have to worry about death. Our future is secure. Those of us that are saved, we have a secure future. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're blessed down on earth, and then we'll be blessed forevermore with the Lord when we leave here. We'll leave these, these the Bible refers to them as, as uh, uh, tents or tabernacles, this, this body. And we'll take on a new body. This mortal, the Bible says, will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruptible. This terrestrial body, this, this human body will put on and become celestial. It's a blessing to have your future secured in, in, in Jesus, to go from death to life. It's a crime for us not to preach Christ, to preach any other gospel. Paul said if, if, if they preach any other gospel, let them be a curse. And the gospel is just good news. So when he says any other gospel, any other good news? So if I got up here and I gave you good news about something else other than the good news of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said, let him be a curse. Meaning that it's that serious. There should be no other message preached, no other good news shouldn't be culture, shouldn't be politics, the state of, uh, of the world and your finances. If we're to preach any other good news, the Bible says that if our gospel if our good news of Jesus Christ be hid, it be hid from them that are lost. So if there's any other good news being presented and we're hiding or not preaching or not teaching or not presenting the good news of Jesus Christ, it's hid from those that need it. is hid from those that are lost. We're, we're, we're not home. The Bible says that this world, the, the devil is the God of this world. This world system and all that's going on and all the things that doesn't make sense. That should alarm us and make us more vigilant when it comes and we talked about this the last time I, I preached and I talked about the vigilance of the saints when it comes to sharing this gospel, how important it is and, and how that if we believe this thing, if we believe the Bible, we should be acting accordingly. If we believe those that are not saved, that they're not going to make it in until they get saved, then the primary goal should be to give them the good news of Jesus Christ, to give them the gospel. Every action should be in line with that thought in mind, that they're out of the ark of safety, that my actions should, should always be 
in line with, I want you to be saved. I want you to give your life to Christ. Saints, we got to pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. The hour is late. The hour is late. We have to pray. This thing is serious. Like I said, I've been off script from the time I said hello. I don't know where I'm at. And I don't believe I have anything else to, to say. That's a way to end the message, huh? Just stop. But I believe that we should value this salvation because Jesus paid a lot for it. It's free, as they say, it's free, but it's not cheap. And it's the greatest gift that God could have given to mankind. Mankind was lost. Then Jesus, he, he brought grace. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that uh, the law that came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He brought grace. Unmerited favor. Let us all stand. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give him a clap offering. He's worthy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't even know why I put these notes together. They never served me well. Praise the Lord. At this time, we're we're making an appeal to those that, you know, we as the, 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 the ministers, it's not for us to assume that everyone is saved or that a person doesn't need to rededicate themselves to the Lord or what have you. That's not my job to just assume. So we, we make an appeal every time we preach. Would you like to give your life to the Lord? Do you need to rededicate yourself? Do you see that I'm not living the way God wants me to be? I've, I've, I've gotten away from how it was when I first got saved. Well, you may see that I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've been going to the church all my life, been on the choir, been a trustee, board member, but I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've just gone to church. This is your opportunity to receive Jesus. That's most important. When we stand before him, your church membership will not be sufficient. He's got to see your name written in the Lamb's book of life. He's got to see you covered in his blood. You've been in fellowship with him. So we make this appeal.
Jesus is 